Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayer's Now Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. Dear participants, welcome to the very first session of the International and Intercontextual Lecture Series on Public Theology by an array of international experts from the global South and North. It is brought to you by an international cooperation network consisting of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology of the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, the Bayer's Nodia Institute for Public Theology at the University of Stellenbosch, South Africa, and the Lutheran World Federation, Geneva. It will assemble leading experts from all over the world who will deliver lectures on different aspects of public theology. This lecture series will comprise video and audio lectures, as well as study material on PDF, and it will be available free of charge. We hope that graduate and postgraduate students of public theology, as well as those who are interested, just the interested public, may profit from it. So this is the very first lecture in the series, and today we're going to present stories from public theology around the world. And the intention is to give an impression of what public theology is all about. And we've gathered stories from Malaysia, the United States of America, from Nigeria, and from Germany. Now, of course, many more could be added. The story from Malaysia will be presented by the Reverend Herman Shastri, who serves as the General Secretary of the Council of Churches of Malaysia. The story from the United States will be told by Professor Marcia Pelli, who teaches cultural and religious studies in New York and in Berlin. Now, Professor Godwin Akper will tell us about public theology in Nigeria, where he teaches at Abuja's National Open University of Nigeria. And Bishop Heinrich Bedford-Strom will tell a story about public theology in Germany. By the way, my name is Sivin Kitt. I serve as Program Executive for Public Theology and Interreligious Relations at the Lutheran World Federation based in Geneva. We are really happy to work with partners to nurture reflection among faith leaders on issues such as these. And we look forward to discover new ways of engaging in the public sphere with interfaith and other partners to bring about meaningful change in society. We strongly believe Christian communities have a public dimension as we are called by God to be transformative agents in the world. And I am Dion Foster. I teach systematic theology and ethics at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa and also serve as the director of the Bayes Nadir Institute for Public Theology. We are so grateful to be able to share in this initiative with colleagues and with friends. My name is Thorsten Meyerreis. I teach systematic theology and ethics at Berlin's Humboldt University and serve as the director of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology. I also want to thank all the contributors to this effort, institutional and individual. But now it's time for our introductory stories on public theology around the world. Join me in welcoming the Reverend Herman Shastri, Professors Marsha Pally and Godwin Akper, and Bishop Heinrich Bedford-Strom. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Herman Shastri, and I'm the General Secretary of the uh, National Council of Churches of Malaysia, and I've been in the position for many years. Because of my work, I also have a relationship with the World Council of Churches, uh, in its work, uh, particularly uh, Faith and Order Commission, and also uh, of the uh, regional ecumenical body called the CCC. Uh, I want to address the issue of uh, public theology coming from a context uh, like my country, uh, Malaysia. During uh, my seminary studies, and especially when I came across theologians like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, I realized the importance of uh, giving expression to the Christian faith in a language that not only speaks to the church, but also uh, to the wider public, taking into consideration uh, the challenges 
that are faced by Christians in a society. And since then, and since we live in Asia, uh, my basic interest has always been uh, contextual theology and to see how uh, the theology that we talk about uh, speaks uh, not only to the church and its mission in a given context, but also uh, to the larger uh, wider population. And so in the case of Malaysia, uh, the, uh, we live in a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, society. And so uh, uh, the Christian church is a minority among many other uh, minority religions. The majority uh, population are Muslims. So the immediate context is, of course, uh, interfaith dialogue, what that's been, uh, how do the religions uh, relate with each other in a meaningful way? How do we converse with each other? How do we uh, phrase our conversation, frame our uh, discussions and discourse so that it not only takes into view uh, the uh, work and witness and service that the church wants to engage in, but also uh, how it contributes to the wider good uh, in the population. So that's a very important aspect. And so in the case of uh, interfaith relations in Malaysia, uh, majority of the people are Muslims and therefore there is also a process of uh, Islam influencing uh, public policy. And so there are times when we have to uh, address that issue and we do that in the best way uh, we can. Secondly, we also have uh, indigenous communities. And so uh, we also try to give uh, attention to that aspect, uh, very important. Uh, so Bibles are translated into the languages of the uh, different ethnic groups, preserving their language, uh, understanding their culture and relating with them in a way uh, that uh, would give them dignity as uh, minority uh, communities. But more important of all, uh, that they would also be able to understand uh, the Christian faith, uh, give articulation to it uh, from their own indigenous uh, context. Like uh, every other society uh, in the world today, we are also confronted with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And so uh, the Council of Churches have played a very important role to keep the churches informed of the various uh, standard operating procedures that come out from the government and to also uh, how best to engage in a spiritual oversight among our people, but in a safe way, in an innovative way, and in a way that would bring people uh, closer together, uh, not in terms physically, but uh, in terms of spiritually. And lastly, I would like to also say that in our work in public theology here. We also want to uh, address uh, the global concerns. Uh, so we engage with the wider ecumenical movement. So climate change is a very big uh, issue. Uh, as you know, Malaysia is a tropical country and so the rainforest uh, covers a large part of the country. And so we try to work to preserve uh, biodiversity, uh, in our country and speak up very strongly uh, against deforestation or any other measures that would uh, threaten uh, the life of uh, the forests and uh, the beautiful uh, landscapes that we have in our country. So that is uh, how we in Malaysia would think about uh, public theology. Thank you. I'm Professor Marsha Pally teaching at New York University and a regular guest professor at the theology faculty of Humboldt Universität, Humboldt University in Berlin. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about American white evangelicals and right-wing populism and the January 6th riot at the US Capitol building where the Congress meets. The title, more or less of this talk is that 
evangelicalism and right-wing populism in America is not a Faustian bargain. And that's exactly what I'm going to explain now. The affinity between white American evangelicals and right-wing populism has been a puzzlement for many around the globe. In 2016, 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump, a man famous for immoral behavior with women and in business. In 2020, 76 to 80% repeated that vote. The January 6th, 2021 riot at the US Capitol building was an eruption of right wing rage melded, mixed with white Christianity. Christian symbols and flags were displayed alongside political ones. And one group that entered the Senate chamber prayed, quote, we will not allow America, the American way of the United States of America to go down in Christ's holy name, we pray, close quote. What is this affinity between white evangelicals and right-wing populism about? Doctrine alone won't suffice as an answer. After all, evangelicals of color and evangelicals in other countries share much doctrine with white American evangelicals, but come to quite different political positions. To answer, we need a few words about populism and a few about white American evangelical history, as well as faith. Populism is a way of presenting solutions to duress, not only economic duress, but status loss and way of life duress that emerge from changes in technologies, gender roles, demographics, etc. Populism finds solution in us, them frameworks. Normally, people pay attention to the flourishing of their own group, the in-group, the we. But under duress, attention turns to attacking the out-group, the them, ostensibly the source of duress. Especially attractive are out-groups against whom one may be effective in harming. A minority population, for instance, rather than a complex force one feels helpless to fight, such as technological change. Also appealing are outgroups that are familiar in the cultural political history. The most easily grasped populist solutions are familiar, drawn from a society's historical cultural background and from the ways that background has traditionally turned to us them frameworks. White evangelicals, like other Americans, face the economic and way of life duresses frequent now among working and middle classes in many countries, especially those in old industry regions. So I'll turn to the duresses that bear additionally on evangelicals, those that emerge from what evangelicals see as marginalization in an increasingly secular society. In 1968, Prayer in America was removed from public schools. In 1973, abortion became legal. 2010 saw the federal mandate that employers offer birth control in company health insurance plans. In 2015, gay marriage became legal. If duress of all sorts prods people to us them frameworks that are familiar, who are the familiar outgroups, the thems, traditional in America? First, federal government. Immigrants to this country were fleeing states that were politically, economically, or religiously oppressive, making immigrants suspicious of strong states. The rough conditions of frontier settlement also advised reliance on one's local community and wariness of faraway central government. Following from this came a wariness of other outsiders new immigrants, minorities, believed to threaten the independent, self-reliant way of life free from an interfering central government. For instance, both the Shays and Whiskey rebellions against Washington and the anti-immigrant alien sedition acts began in the 18th century, almost as soon as the United States itself began. Evangelicals, the dissenting and much persecuted sects of Europe were especially wary of states and state churches as they had suffered much against them in Europe. Importantly, evangelical theology emphasizes not only Bible reading, sola scriptura, 
but the priesthood of all believers, individual Bible reading by each man and woman, making evangelicals even more wary of authorities, both political and ecclesial. Together, the immigrant suspicion of government, the frontier reliance on local community, and the evangelical experience years, yields an evangelical history and culture that is wary of Washington, D.C., elites and outsiders. As two 19th century Kentucky revivalists said, we are not personally acquainted with the writings of John Calvin and neither do we care. This is what American right-wing populism and Donald Trump offered of them an outgroup of government and outsiders. In his 2016 campaign, Trump promised to, quote, drain the swamp of, quote, Washington insiders. Throughout his presidency, he railed against the, quote, deep state and media and university elites. He fomented anti-immigrant animus reduced government regulation of business and finance, and drastically reduced government social programs by cutting taxes and reducing or closing government departments. In sum, white evangelical support for Republicans and right-wing populism is not a Faustian bargain where evangelicals provide political support in exchange for Republican party backing on religious matters such as abortion. Rather, it is political support for political policies. When evangelicals are drawn to Republican and right-wing populist proposals, they seek relief from interrelated duresses by turning to tra traditional belief in self-reliant local community unmolested by an overreaching interloper government and other outsiders. White evangelicals weight these concerns along with those arising from religion, such as abortion and gay marriage. The best research on evangelical voting in 2016 and 2020 found that the factor most decisive in determining the evangelical vote was the economy. That is, strong majorities of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump owing to his and the Republican Party's small government economic positions. Abortion was the most important factor for half as many evangelicals as chose the economy. LGBTQ issues for only a quarter. White evangelical politics, like all politics, is a composite of socioeconomic way of life and religious concerns. Understanding it means looking into socio-political history as well as into religious history and doctrine to find out why right-wing populism is understood by white evangelicals as making the best person and society. Thank you. Hello, my name is Godwin Yonengi Akwe. I'm professor of systematic theology at National Open University of Nigeria, Abuja, here in Nigeria. Uh, colleagues, public theology in the Nigerian context means to many agitation for better well-being of the downtrodden, using religious values and platforms for discourse on social, political, and economic policies made by the government of the day. So church leaders, mostly when they are talking about uh, uh, public theology, they feel the engagement uh, of the church, of church leaders, and other religious organizations, be they Christians or otherwise, in policy formations, uh, critique of bad policies, issues of moral regeneration, and then the issue of uh, economic uh, recovery and the plight of the poor, especially those in IDB camps, which are in now in millions. One of the most controversial issues of public theology in Germany in the last years has been the Church's stand on search and rescue missions for refugees in the Mediterranean. Since 2014, about 21,500 refugees have drowned in the Mediterranean in their effort to reach Europe on life-endangering rubber boats. As churches, we have often spoken up in order to get the European authorities to stop this dying. 
while the European Union participated in rescue missions in former years, those missions came to a complete stop when the right-wing populist Italian Interior Minister Salvini refused to let any rescued refugees enter the ports of Italy. In this situation, I made a trip to Sicily at the beginning of June 2019 to visit the crew of Sea Watch 3, a search and rescue vessel operated by the German search and rescue organization Sea Watch. Members of the crew were accused by Italian authorities of participating in human trafficking. The Sea Watch 3 was held in the port of the Sicilian town of Licata and blocked from going back into the Mediterranean to rescue refugees. On the day after my meeting with the Sea Watch crew, I published the so called Palermo Appeal in the Sicilian city of Palermo together with its mayor Leo Luca Orlando, who is known as a strong supporter of an open refugee policy. Many people in Italy, Germany and beyond supported the Palermo Appeal, which confronted the criminalization of civil rescuers, argued for a free access of rescue vessels to the Mediterranean, and for a European mechanism of distributing rescued refugees in those cities and towns in Europe, which have declared their will for that. After the publication of the Palermo Appeal, the Deutsche Evangelische Kirchentag in Dortmund, a big four-day lay convention of church people with around 100,000 participants in different forums, one forum issued an appeal to the Protestant church leadership to buy an own search and rescue vessel as a church. As chairman of the Council of Protestant Churches in Germany, which represent about 21 million Christians in Germany, I supported the proposal. And the Council as a whole decided to form an alliance of churches and civil society organizations to support civil rescue operations in the Mediterranean in cooperation with Sea-Watch. In December 2019, the newly founded alliance United for Rescue asked for donations to buy a vessel. Two months later, more than 1 million euros had been donated and the Alliance could buy a vessel which then could operate under the name of Sea Watch 4. Because of the pandemic, the preparations took longer and after its first mission last summer, during which it rescued 352 people, it was held in the port of Palermo by the Italian authorities. The legal struggle initiated by Sea-Watch will be decided by the European Court of Justice. Meanwhile, the Sea-Watch 4 can finally continue with rescue operations, as was, as was decided by an Italian court in February. <clears throat> Why are we doing this? Human dignity, and together with it, the soul of Europe, is at stake when we simply watch while desperate people in life endangering rubber boats are drowning. Controversial discussions about the design of migration and asylum politics can and must be led, but they cannot be seen as alternatives to direct action to save lives. Saving these lives is only one but an especially important piece of a diaconical strategy which includes overcoming the root causes of migration by creating perspectives of a life in dignity in the countries of origin, just as much as helping people in direct need who have nevertheless started an often life-endangering trip north, often ending in Libyan refugee camps which heavily violate human rights. And such a diaconical strategy also includes political support for fair legal asylum procedures for those who have entered Europe to seek asylum. <clears throat> 
From a Christian standpoint, it must be clear that our responsibility does not end at the border of our own country or continent, but has to be seen in a universal horizon. With the famous words of Max Weber, conviction and responsibility are not contradictory, but complementary. Thus, everyone who shares the conviction that the dignity of the human person is a universally valid claim, or as we Christians believe, every human being is created in the image of God, will have to either support rescuing people from drowning and then opening up a fair legal procedure or, ex or explain how this claim can be followed in another way. While we see our involvement in search and rescue operations, first of all, as a humanitarian mission, it is also a political sign reminding Europe to its own humanitarian and spiritual traditions. Of course, this topic has been very controversial, also in the church. There was much hate in the mails and letters, especially at the beginning. But I have also had many discussions with critics who were ready to exchange arguments on a common Christian basis. Those discussions were fruitful. There were, however, also love storms that I had never experienced in my whole time as a bishop before, especially from the young generation. While one side in the discussion said that the church should restrain from political involvement, the other side said that if the church wants to be credible, it must include concrete action and therefore cannot restrain from political advocacy. With the words of the first and second of my own six criteria for, for, for public theology, our involvement is bilingual. It is based on firm biblical convictions such as the commandment of love or the identi identification of Jesus with the strangers in Matthew 25. But it is also rooted in reasonable argument, as it is reflected in the European Enlightenment traditions. It is interdisciplinary by including perspectives outside the Church that led to an alliance of now 727 organizations. It is prophetic by criticizing the European authorities for their denial of concrete rescue action. And it is universally oriented by affirming the right to life no matter why people have entered these life-endangering rubber boats. I conclude by saying the Church's involvement in search and rescue operations is a concrete case of practiced public theology, which is certainly worth to be analyzed and controversially discussed. And I'm glad that the Berlin Institute for Public Theology is such an excellent place for it. Well, we hope we've got you interested. Feel free to use the material. And we are really looking forward to your feedback, your responses, and any reports on your learning experiences. May God blessing be with you.